Well, good morning, church. It's good to be with all of you this morning. Um, he already introduced me, so I won't introduce myself. Um, but I'm really uh, excited about the message. It's uh, really a privilege for me to be able to share the Word of God with you this morning. So if you have your Bibles, uh, we'll be reading from Mark 14, 66 through 72. Now, before you read it, I want to remind us all where we've been at in our journey through the Gospel of Mark. So for the last few weeks, we've been talking about the final night before Jesus was crucified. And so we read about the famous Last Supper where Jesus and his disciples ate the Passover meal. And Jesus told his disciples at the meal that someone would betray him, which was Judas. And then after the meal, he told them that actually all the disciples would fall away. And on that same night, they went out to the Mount of Olives to a place called Gethsemane. This is where Jesus was praying fervently and where the servants of the high priest showed up to arrest Jesus. And so they arrested Jesus, took him back to the home of the high priest, and that's where they put him on trial wrongfully. And many uh, people came forward to tell lies about him, make false accusations about him. And ultimately, they decided he was worthy of death because of his supposed blasphemy. And then uh, they spit on him, mocked him, beat him, and gave him back over to the guards. And that's where we come to our passage today, which is about Peter's infamous denials of Christ in the courtyard of the high priest's home. See, when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples did fall away. They all uh, fled. But Peter was the only one that actually followed at a distance and made his way into the courtyard of the high priest's home. And so there he was warming himself by the fire Uh, while Jesus was wrongfully put on trial, and that's where we pick up our text today. So let's go ahead and read it together. You can follow along uh, in your Bibles or on the screen. Again, Mark 14, 66 through 72. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also are with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to come together and worship you through music, through songs, through fellowship, through the reading and preaching of your word. God, as we read your word, as we uh, meditate on it today, would you speak to our hearts? Would you open up our ears to hear what you want to speak to us through this passage? And would you help us, Lord, to, to live it out as well? In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I would like to open up with a story about a time about five or six years ago when my dad and I were driving around in the desert. Uh, And just to preface it, I did get my dad's permission to tell this story. And um, so if you don't know, I grew up in Henderson, Nevada, which is right next to Las Vegas. And on the outskirts of the city, there are these large areas of desert, kind of like in Phoenix. And, you know, people go off-roading, quadding, dirt biking, you know, shooting, all sorts of stuff out there. And so one day, my dad and I were out there driving around in our minivan, because that's just what we had at the time. And we came upon this steep ditch. And it was like a steep decline going into the ditch. And then uh, right not too long after was a steep incline. But it was going out to this really cool-looking area of the desert. So we talked amongst ourselves, and we're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could make it down and up to the other side? The only problem was it looked a little bit risky. And uh, I didn't feel so confident that we could make it down and up to the other side. Maybe I was being a wimp, you know, I don't know. Uh, But my dad, on the other hand, felt confident that we could could make it across to the other side. Uh, He told me about back in the day, you know, he'd driven up super steep hills in the snow and cars and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, well, I don't feel confident. Let me me get out and uh, watch on the sidelines. So my dad got in the driver's seat, begins to proceed up to the ditch. And here he goes, the the van's starting to go down to the bottom. It looks like he's gonna make it. And then boom, the front of the van gets stuck in the incline of the other side of the ditch. So he puts it in reverse, the wheels are spinning and spinning, and we're stuck. And uh, it took uh, three hours before the tow truck uh, showed up. And during those three hours, we were digging out the dirt the whole time, you know, from the front of the van, and then laying rocks behind it to try to, you know, get some traction to get out on our own. And uh, as we saw the tow truck approaching, my dad told me, hurry up, jump in the, in the front of the, you know, jump in the driver's seat and try to reverse us back out before they get here. 
and I was able to. I got in and reversed us back out to where we were. And I think we did save a little money because uh, we didn't have to, you know, pay for the full towing out of there. But man, uh, it was a lot of work. And it was pretty much a bummer that we spent the whole trip just with that scenario. And uh, now looking back on it, my dad, we talk about it, we laugh about it. Uh, but I tell this story because it's an example of how overconfidence in ourselves can often lead to humbling circumstances, which is very related to our text today. As we look at Peter before, during, and after his denials of Christ, we'll see that God uh, wants us not to live in self-confidence because that leads to self-destruction, but he wants us to live in self-denial. So the idea that I want you to keep in mind for today's message can be summed up with this scripture. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So first, we're going to take a look at Peter before his denials of Christ, because it's important to be reminded of what just happened before our text today. So um, that's my first point. Before Peter's denials, he had self-confidence. Just a few verses back in Mark 14, when Jesus told his disciples that they would all fall away, there's a conversation that he had with Peter that I want to remind us of, and it's uh, just verses 29 through 31. And Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, this is Peter talking, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. So here we see that after the Last Supper, Jesus prophetically tells Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows twice. And how does Peter respond? Well, he emphatically disagrees and says that he will not deny Christ under any circumstances, even if he has to die. And that's the first crucial thing I want to point out, that before Peter's denials, he demonstrated self-confidence by not trusting Jesus' words. So he didn't believe what Jesus was telling him. And this isn't the first time that Peter has been bold in disagreeing with Jesus. Actually, earlier in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus was telling his disciples about how he would be rejected and killed. And Peter took Jesus aside and began rebuking him about that. And can you imagine that? Rebuking the divine son of God, the king of kings, telling him he's got something wrong with his plan of salvation or his theology. Of course, then Jesus rebukes him back and says, get behind me, Satan. And then uh, I'll, there's another time, actually, when Peter disagrees with Jesus before his denials. And it was actually at the Last Supper, if you remember, uh, when Jesus began washing his disciples' feet. The Gospel of John tells us that when he got to Peter, Peter said, you will not wash my feet. And uh, after they went back and forth a little bit, Peter finally agreed to let Jesus just wash his feet. But I give these examples to show that before his denials, Peter demonstrated self-confidence first by not trusting Jesus' words. And secondly, Peter demonstrated self-confidence by not praying. Again, just a few verses back in Mark, uh, same chapter, Mark 14, uh, tells us about when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there's another conversation that, that he has with Peter. So I'm just going to read verses 37 to 41. And he came and found them sleeping. And when he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So, now in the garden, Jesus tells Peter specifically, if you don't watch and pray, you may enter into temptation. You may give into the flesh. And that's exactly what happened. Peter and the disciples failed to pray completely, and uh, they fell asleep instead. I also want to point out that uh, it was three times that Jesus came back to tell Peter and the disciples to pray, and three times they failed, which is just an interesting parallel with our text today. So I want you to keep that in mind. Now, how does Peter not praying demonstrate his self-confidence? Well, because it revealed that he didn't think prayer was as necessary as it was. He didn't recognize his desperate need to depend on God in prayer, but rather he was depending on his own strength and his own abilities. Now, I want to tell you a story about a time when I was a fairly new believer, and uh, I actually set a goal for myself to pray three times a day. And I did this because I had read about how Daniel in the Bible had prayed three times a day. That was his custom. 
And so, you know, Daniel's a faithful man of God, and I wanted to be that too. So I set this goal, but um, guess how many days in a row I was actually able to keep uh, my goal of praying three times a day? Show me on your hands if you could give me some numbers out there. It's not more than 10, so you won't need two hands. I can promise that. Oh, man, you guys are really generous. Some of you are more accurate. Um, it was actually barely one day I could make it. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> praying three times a day. And I was a little confused. I was a little frustrated. Like, why is this so hard? Why can't, why can't I do this? And uh, later, I realized that I made the goal out of selfish and prideful motives. You know, it wasn't a bad goal. But the reason I made the goal was because I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be on par with the most faithful men in the Bible. And I thought I could be. But I was missing the whole point of prayer because prayer is not about us being lifted up, but rather prayer is about us bowing low before God, recognizing our need for him, asking for his help, his strength. And I had it backwards. I was so confident in my abilities and my will to pray that I failed miserably. So today, I want to challenge all of us to reflect on the areas of our lives where we may be a little too overconfident. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. So how do we do this? How do we figure out what areas we're too self-reliant in? Well, we can ask ourselves two questions. Number one, what areas of my life do I not trust or consult God's word? What areas of my life do I not trust or consult God's word for? And number two, what areas of my life do I not pray about? And just like for Peter, these two things may be indicators that we have a little bit too much self-confidence. So for example, do you trust God's word about what it says is right and wrong? Do you strive to implement what the word says about how to navigate relationships in your life, such as marriage or friendships? Have you consulted it for how you should be parenting? And similar questions can be asked of prayer. Have you thanked God recently for your relationships? Have you asked God for guidance with your career? Do you proactively pray to ask God for strength to overcome possible temptations? And with your plans for the future, do you entrust those to God in prayer? The book of James tells us that if we're talking about the, our plans for the future, we shouldn't act like we're the ones that are going to make it happen. But rather, we should say, if God wills, I'm going to do this or that. So it's important that we acknowledge God in all these areas, seeking him through his word and through prayer, which always help to keep our self-confidence in check. Now, these are all just examples that I hope stir you up to put more of your trust in God. All right, so why did I take all that time just explaining Peter's attitude before our text today? Well, I wanted us to get a good grasp of just how high and lifted up Peter was in his own eyes so that we can better comprehend the impact of his fall in our text today. See, if one person falls out of their bed and another person falls off the top of a ladder, which one has the greater impact? The one who is higher up, right? So now that we've seen how before Peter's denials, he was self-confident, we're going to dive into the meat of our text today to see how during Peter's denials, he self-destructed. And that's my second point. During his denials, he completely self-destructed. Uh, we're going to break up our passage into two parts today. So we're just going to read 66 through 68 right now. This is about his first denial. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also are with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. So let me remind you of where Peter's at. He's in the courtyard of the high priest's home, warming himself by the fire, while Jesus is there as well, being put on trial in an upper room. Now, uh, let me also remind you of where he's at mentally. He's probably very afraid and very confused at this point because he couldn't wrap his mind around the fact that Jesus' death was actually a part of God's plan for salvation. If you remember when Jesus was being arrested in the garden, Peter cut off the ear of the servant, one of the servants of the high priest, because he was trying to fight a physical battle and didn't understand the Messiah was coming to have victory in a spiritual battle over sin, over death, and over Satan. And as Johnny mentioned last week, uh, we can't be too hard on Peter because it did take some courage to make his way into the courtyard. You know, all the other disciples just fled completely. So we do have to give him a little credit for that. So here Peter is by the fire, and one of the servant girls of the high priest recognizes him as someone who has been with Jesus. 
Now, I want to stop right here and say something about this because it's very applicable to us. People will recognize when you've been with Jesus. If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be able to easily blend in with the world when it comes to your character or the way you live your life. Your life will be different, and people will notice that you're a follower of Jesus. So I just had to say that really quick. Now, back to the story. So the servant girl calls Peter out that she's seen him with Jesus. And how does Peter respond? Well, he says, I neither know nor understand what you mean. For some reason, this reminds me of a kid, you know, gets caught eating out of a cookie jar, trying to lie about it. Like his mom says, Timmy, I saw you eating out of the cookie jar. And Timmy says, Mom, I neither know nor understand what you mean. As he has crumbs all over his mouth, you know. Now, I know that's a trivial comparison to Peter's lie in this scenario, but wow, how could Peter, who just a few hours earlier said he would never deny Christ under any circumstances, now deny even knowing who Jesus is? This is quite the fall. Peter's next move was to head towards the gateway, or some translations call it the forecourt or uh, the porch, which just means basically toward the entryway of the high priest's home where he came in. And so at this point, he's trying to retreat away from the situation, most likely not to get confronted again, or maybe to get out of the firelight so they can't see his face and recognize him. And this is also when the rooster crows for the first time, but we don't have any indication that it's making a difference with Peter yet or, you know, registering with Peter. So that was the first denial. Let's go ahead and keep reading uh, about the second and third denials, Mark 14, 69 through 72. And the servant girl saw him and began again saying to, the, to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. So if Peter's plan was to get away from being confronted again, we see here that it didn't work because the servant girl saw him again and uh, began, notice this time, instead of confronting him directly, she started telling others, hey, he's been with Jesus. He's one of them. So she started getting others involved now. And uh, Peter denies knowing Jesus now for the second time as things just keep getting worse. And that's how lying often works, right? When you lie one time, you usually have to keep lying over and over and over to try to keep up the story or the facade or whatever you're lying about. So we just shouldn't lie from the start. Now, um, the text says in verse 70, after a little while, the third denial happens. So how long was a little while? Well, Luke's gospel actually tells us that there was about an hour between the second and third denials, uh, which means that Peter uh, had time to think about, you know, what he was doing between those denials. And I know we read the text in 30 seconds, so it can seem like, you know, it's all back to back to back. But actually, the whole scenario was about an hour or two that Peter was in the courtyard denying Jesus. So if it wasn't bad enough already, now we come to his third and worst denial. This time, notice the bystanders now jump in, and they are the ones confronting him. And they even offer up some strong evidence against Peter's lie. Evidence number one, they said that they could tell he was with Jesus because he was from the same hometown of Galilee. Now, how do they know this? How do they know that Peter was from the same hometown as Jesus from Galilee? Was it something he was wearing? Or what was it about about him that they could tell? Well, the parallel account in Matthew actually lets us know that it was his accent that gave him away. See, with the way he was talking, you could tell he was from Galilee. Sorry, I love doing accents. My wife will tell you that. I couldn't help it on that one. (laughs) Evidence number two, the Gospel of John tells us that one of the bystanders said he saw Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane because he was actually a relative of the guy who got his ear cut off by Peter. So literally, one of the bystanders there confronting Peter was like a relative, like a cousin or something of the guy who got his ear cut off by Peter, and he saw Peter as well in the Garden. Unfortunately, with these two pieces of evidence offered against Peter, He didn't say, okay, you guys got me. I'm from the same hometown as Jesus from Galilee. Or, you know, you saw me cut the guy's ear off. I'm guilty. No, but rather, Peter escalated his lie even further to the highest degree possible by cursing and swearing. Now, when the text says he invoked a curse on himself and began swearing, it doesn't mean he used curse words like we think about today. It's more of the type of swearing where he's saying, I swear on my life, I don't know the man. 
or it may have been something to the effect of, may God curse me if I'm lying. I don't know him. So he was cursing and swearing in that way. Now, I'm sure Peter felt like at this point he was being ganged up on because the accusations seem to be escalating if you think about it. The first accusation was just one servant girl confronting him one-on-one. And then the second one, she started to tell others around him, you know, hey, he's with Jesus. He's been with Jesus. So she started getting others involved. And then the third instance was all of those around them, all the bystanders confronting Peter together and even offering up strong evidence against his lies. So the amount of accusations had greatly escalated. And it seems that through cursing and swearing, Peter tried to escalate his lies to match them. And at this point, I think it's safe to say that Peter is completely self-destructing. His integrity was destroyed. His earlier claims to Jesus were destroyed. His relationship with God was seemingly destroyed. And his ability to be a witness to others was completely destroyed. I mean, how can you tell others about Jesus if you're denying even knowing who Jesus is? And at the height of Peter's lies, when he was denying Jesus to the maximum level that he possibly could, what happens? The rooster crows the second time, just like Jesus said it would. The text tells us that the crow of the rooster caused Peter to remember Jesus' words, and he wept because of it. And not only did he remember Jesus' words, but I'm sure he remembered his own when he said that he would never deny Christ. So this is a huge wake-up call for Peter about his own frailty and Jesus' faithfulness, about his own weakness and Jesus' strength. And the sound of a rooster couldn't be more fitting for this milestone of a moment in Peter's life because the sound of a rooster is, it's a call for people to wake up in the morning, right? For Peter, it was a call to wake up from the lie that he didn't need to always trust God's word. It was a call to wake up from the lie that he didn't need God's power, strength, guidance, protection in this life. He didn't need to pray for that. Ultimately, it was a call to wake up to the reality that Jesus is the only faithful, righteous, trustworthy Savior, not anyone else, even ourselves. Now, I want you to think about the contrast that Mark is drawing at this point in his gospel. Jesus was carried off in chains. Peter was comforting himself by the fire. Jesus was accused by the chief priest and spoke only truth. Peter was accused by just a servant girl and spoke lies. Jesus was willing to be beaten, mocked, and spit upon, yet he humbled himself for the sake of others. Peter was only verbally attacked, and yet he was trying to do everything he could to lift himself up in their eyes. Because Jesus is the only man who has ever been truly good because he's the divine son of God who came to save us from our sins. Now, I wanna tell you about a time when I denied Christ before men. It wasn't in the same way as Peter, uh, but it was denying him and it was very self-destructive. Not long after I became a believer, I would listen to a lot of Christian music in my uh, apartment style dorm room my freshman year of college. But whenever one of my roommates or friends would come in or come close enough to hear my music, I would turn it down so they couldn't hear it. Now, I did this out of fear of what they would think, fear out of them potentially treating me differently because of it. But when I look back on it, it was very self-destructive because I was denying God with my actions. I was ashamed to proclaim my love and loyalty for Jesus because of what others would think. And uh, not only was it destructive to my relationship with God and my worship of him, but it was destructive to my ability to be a witness to my roommates Because like Peter, I was trying to blend in with them. I tried to blend in with the darkness instead of being the light they needed by pointing them to Jesus or at least letting them hear some worship music, you know. But uh, I thank God that he was so gracious to me during that time while I was still growing. I'm still growing, by the way. (laughs) Doesn't mean I stopped. Uh, Church today, I want to challenge you to live unashamed of your faith. Be bold in proclaiming the name of Jesus in your actions and in your words. And of course, not in a prideful or arrogant way, for we know that Jesus hates religiosity for show, but in a humble, loving, yet unashamed manner. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? And he said, you are the light of the world, and no one puts a lamp under a basket, but rather they put it on a lampstand so it gives light to all who are in the house. If we submit to the fear of others' opinions, then we're losing our flavor. 
If we submit to the fear of how others will treat us because of our faith, then we're covering up the light that Jesus gave us to give to others. So don't let the fear of others stop you from walking in integrity and following Jesus. When those around you, whether it be family, friends, or coworkers, are doing what's wrong, don't go along with them for fear that you might stand out. You will stand out. Every believer will. But don't self-destruct and destroy your ability to witness to them by trying to blend in. But how do we do this? How do we love God more than we fear others? Do we just try harder to be more unashamed and be more bold? No. The lesson that Peter learns through this refining situation was to live in self-denial. And that's my third and final point, that afterwards, Peter learned to live in self-denial. He learned to take a more humble approach. Of course, Jesus taught about this in his ministry when he said that if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, come after me, and take, take up his cross. But how do we know that Peter learned to live in self-denial? Well, the rest of the Bible tells us. At the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, right before the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost, where was Peter at? He was in the upper room with the other disciples. And what was he doing? He was praying the very thing that he failed to do in the Garden of Gethsemane. And prayer is the very essence of self-denial like we're talking about. It's worshiping God, asking for his help, his intervention. And right after that, Peter got up and boldly proclaimed the gospel. And thousands of people came to salvation. And throughout the rest of the book of Acts, Peter demonstrates this boldness of faith regardless of the consequences. And there were many consequences, such as being beaten and thrown into jail. And not only that, but in Peter's letters, he encourages others to live in self-denial and to trust Christ rather than ourselves. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter doesn't tell people, you know, just to follow your heart or uh, just believe in yourself enough and you can do anything. No, it's, it's the opposite of what the world is telling us. But rather, Peter tells people, prepare your minds. Get your mind ready. Get mentally prepared. And he also says, be sober-minded, which, by the way, involves not thinking too highly of yourself. And he says, put all of your hope and all of your trust in Jesus and the grace that he gives us now and when he returns. That's how we live in self-denial, by trusting in him, by constantly seeking him through his word and prayer and giving him glory, seeking his glory rather than our own and being willing to follow what he says, no matter the consequences. Now, if you're here today and you feel like you're good with God and you do everything pretty good as far as you know, then maybe you're a little too self-confident like Peter was before his denials. We all have blind spots. And like I said earlier, the word says, if you think you're standing strong, be careful not to fall. So don't forget to pray and don't forget to trust in and live out his word. If you're here today and you feel like you've self-destructed, you've sinned, you've denied Jesus somehow, you're uh, broken, you feel like your relationship with God is broken, there's still hope. Although Peter self-destructed, sinned, and even denied Jesus, he was still given forgiveness and was restored. After Jesus' resurrection, he met the disciples on the shore and uh, he asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter responded, yes, every time. And he was restored to being a great leader in the early church like we just talked about. Now, I just have to point this out. Isn't it interesting that Peter failed three times to pray in the garden of Gethsemane? And then he denied Jesus three times in the courtyard of the high priest's home. And then Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? This tells me that there is continual forgiveness and grace that God gives believers throughout our lives. And though even, even though we may fail over and over, God's grace and mercy is more and will keep us to the end. It's just our job to stay humble, to stay humble and repentant before him. So if you love Jesus, then continue to follow him and trust in his love for you and the purpose he still has for your life, despite any failures you've had or any failures you may continue to have. Yes, keep striving to do good, but don't trust yourself. Trust in him. Rest your hope fully on his grace. And church, as I wrap up the message today, if there's one thing that you take away, let it be this. Have confidence in Christ, but have suspicion with self. 
Have confidence in Christ, but have suspicion with self, meaning you don't have to hesitate when putting your trust in Jesus for something. But you should hesitate when you realize that you've only been trusting in your abilities, your strength, your skill, because Jesus is perfect, but we're so fallible. Now, Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 uh, puts it this way. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding, but in your, all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. So as you go about this week, I encourage you to think about areas of your life where you can put more confidence in Christ and less in yourself, especially by seeking him through his word and through prayer. If you're here today and you don't love Jesus or you don't know Jesus or you feel like you have no relationship with God, I hope and pray that this message has helped you see that he is the only one who is good, faithful, and reliable. And he came on a rescue mission from heaven to save you from your sins. And he's the only one that could die for our sins because he's perfect and we're not. So don't have confidence in yourself to try to make it to heaven with enough good works or being a good enough person because you're never gonna get yourself there. Peter tried to do things his way too in his own strength, but it never works. Rather, put your confidence in Christ who has already made a way for you to be saved. He's already made a way for you and loved you enough to die for you. So if you wanna make that commitment today to follow Christ, the Bible says you must do two things, repent and believe. And repentance is really just a part of true belief. It just means turn from your sins, resolve in your heart and mind to stop doing what you know is wrong and more importantly, what the Bible says is wrong. So that's repent. Oh, and, and by the way, it doesn't mean that we're gonna be perfect on this earth. That's repent. Now believe just means trusting that Jesus died for your sins, that he rose from the grave three days later so you could be saved into a relationship with him now and in eternity. And if you accept Jesus, it doesn't mean life is gonna be perfect and easy, but it will be the most fulfilling and rewarding relationship you've ever had because you're literally created for it. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for your grace, Lord, that while we're all sinners, we can all identify with Peter. We've all been prideful. We've all destroyed our relationship with you through sin. Thank you that you love us so much that you sent us Jesus to, as a savior, that we could be saved, that we could have a relationship with you. I pray right now, Lord, for people here today who think they're good with you, who, who are a little too overconfident, that for all of us who are too overconfident that you would keep us humble before we have to get humbled, before we reach that self-destruction point. God, would you help us to be humble before you, to trust in you rather than ourselves. And for those here today, Lord, who feel broken, who feel like they're at a low point, they have denied you, they're stagnant in their relationship with you, or they're drifting away, whatever it is that they feel, would you comfort them, Lord? Would this word, this passage comfort them the fact that Peter was given grace because he came back to you humbly. God, I pray today that all of us would take this message, live it out, Lord, that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray all of this, Lord, in your powerful, mighty name. Amen.